Hi, welcome. This is Ed Coppola, Director of Broker Relations and Product Development at Exxon Bank. Welcome to this webcast about some upcoming changes to the Express Insurance program. Um, we're expecting a fairly high attendance on this webcast, so we're just going to wait another minute or two before we get started. So thank you for your patience and stay tuned. Hello again, Ed Coppola here, Director of Broker Relations and Product Development. We'll get started now. We may have some folks chime in as we move along. Again, thank you for calling in to this webcast. Um, I hope you all had a very nice holiday, and I wish you all a very successful 2017. This is the first of quarterly webcasts that we're going to start hosting going forward as part of our effort to be more proactive in reaching out to our brokers and sharing information with them. In addition to that, I'll be hosting bi-monthly um, conference calls with the brokers to provide a somewhat more informal setting to share information and get feedback uh, from yourselves. Uh, the first one of those will be next week on Wednesday, January 18th at 2 p.m. And I will share with you the details about that later, but I just wanted to give you that, that heads up. We appreciate that there will probably be a lot of interest in these changes to the Express uh, product, and it's possible, although so far it does not look like, um, that more people will try to dial in than the system can handle. Um, <clears throat> and I just want you to know that we are recording the webcast, and this will not be the uh, first and last uh, opportunity for brokers to uh, hear and learn about the changes. Uh, we will make this information available in one way, shape, or form. We're told we can post it on the website, uh, and barring any unforeseen obstacles to doing that, we will do that as well. Um, we're going to try to keep this to an hour, but there may be a lot of questions, and we don't want to cut people short, so we'll keep going <clears throat> until we run out of questions or we, we just have to cut it off, in which case we'll make note of all unanswered questions and, and then answer those uh, separately offline. Uh, before handing it over to Jean, um, just want to take care of one housekeeping item. As you know, um, I've been reaching out to all of the brokers, asking them to visit the broker locator on Exxon's website and review the information we have for your contacts there to make sure that it is current and accurate. Um, and I appreciate all of the responses that I've uh, received from you and as well as welcome the conversations I've been able to have with many of you around that uh, as well. Um, unfortunately, as part of that process, some glitches have arisen uh, in the use of the locator, um, particularly with respect to the two filters that appear at the top of the master broker locator list. Uh, I just want you to know, first of all, that we are aware of those uh, difficulties and the folks who are in charge of handling that are aware of that and are dealing with it as we speak. But do know that the entire complete master bro broker locator list is there on the website um, if you do not select any of the filters. So if both of those filter boxes show any, you should be able to find yourself or anyone else that you're looking for. It's just the use of the filters that seems to be creating a problem. So we're looking forward to having that um, changed and corrected as soon as possible, and we apologize for any inconvenience that that may be causing you. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Gene Fitzgerald, the Deputy Vice President of Trade Credit Insurance, 
she'll walk through the changes to the product. Um, we have uh, one or more of her colleagues either here in the room or online to back her up or help her answer any questions that you may have. You can send in your questions in writing on your computer, and we'll be viewing those as they come in. Um, but we're going to try and hold off answering those until the end of the presentation so we give Jean a chance to get through this and perhaps uh, preempt um, some questions that, that you may have in the beginning. Um, we will not identify the questioner's name when you send in a question. Uh, so with that, um, Jean, it's all yours. Thank you, Ed. Um, good morning to the folks out west and good afternoon to the rest of the country. Um, as I said, this, my name is Jean Fitzgibbon and I'm a manager in the Trade Credit Insurance Division. Oh. And <laughs> that's okay, Ed. Um, I have one of the other managers here with me, Anita Tory, and the two of us are going to be discussing today uh, the express policy update, sort of our five-year review and some modifications based on that review and based on feedback we've obtained from you and our outreach to some of the express policyholders today. Um, and as Ed said, we'd be happy to take questions. Um, we already have a few questions ahead of time that we'll I'll run through at the end. Um, and then if anything we don't address or we can't address, I think you all know how to get a hold of myself or Anita, and we'd be happy to you know help you later offline. Before I get started, um, one quick announcement or uh, also solicitation for assistance. The annual conference, I think all of you have maybe seen the announcement, is this April on Thursday and Friday, the 6th and 7th. And on Thursday afternoon of the 6th, uh, the Trade Credit Insurance Division, along with Trade Finance, Amy Schinkman, we are going to be holding a, a seminar in the afternoon, basically focusing on small businesses on the short-term exporter-held policies. And we're looking for, if you have any recommendations of any clients, we're looking for clients that have either um, had a multi-buyer policy and then graduated to the private sector but continue to use us for single buyer policies where they can't obtain private sector policies. We're also looking for companies that came in, they weren't sure about Exxon Bank or the credit insurance process, and they obtained a short-term single buyer policy under with Amy Shop. And then they decided to graduate and do a whole turnover policy, and they came in and took a multi-buyer policy with us. So um, if you have any clients you uh, would recommend you think would be um, willing to, able to come in and, and willing to speak on a panel, we'd love to hear from you. So if you can either contact myself, Tom Fitzpatrick, or Amy Shakeman, would we really appreciate that? We're looking for, let's say, anywhere from three to four companies that would be able to present, again, on Thursday afternoon, April 6th at the annual conference. So, as Ed said, um, the, point of this, the point of this webinar is to discuss the express policy and basically our five-year review and based on that, some modifications. So, to give you a brief reminder or background, we rolled out the express policy at the annual conference in April 2011, and it was introduced as a simplified value-added multi-buyer type product for small businesses targeted for those in particular that were either new to extending credit at all or new to market. Maybe they had been selling to Canada for a couple years and then they all of a sudden decided they wanted to explore opportunities, um, say in Brazil. And they were a little concerned about it or hesitant and so they were looking for something to help them. So again, the aim was to help these small businesses get comfortable extending credit into newer markets and expanding their business opportunities. And initially when we designed the program, in addition to our regular short-term new applicant standards, so for instance, that generally the company's been around for at least three years, business operations, had a tangible net worth, the new criteria we set for the express policy eligibility was that they had 10 foreign buyers to whom they sold to on credit terms or less, and we did allow selectivity. So if you had 10 foreign buyers and you only wanted to insure five of those, that was eligible under the express product. About a year later, based on some feedback we obtained from uh, the exporting the brokerage community, we increased that limit from 10 to 20. So we just recently, last year, we completed it was five year, like I said, we introduced it in April 2011. So we did a five year study, um, one to see, you know, we wanted to do that because it was five years since we introduced the product and see how it was bearing. Also to sort of quantify some of the anecdotal information we, either, we were either obtaining from the outside or 
just from on our day-to-day -day underwriting, talking to our loan officers. So we did a review last year of the express policy results, and here are some of the main takeaways. One, it basically has been, it was, you know, uh, well-received in the marketplace. I would say a marketing success. Um, we, we sold it uh, to a lot of small businesses, and it's become a sizable portion of our portfolio. So, for instance, today we have a little over 2,000 uh, short-term exporter held multi-buyer policies, and roughly half of those now are specifically express policy holders. Um, but here's the however part of our uh, analysis that we uh, we uncovered and sort of, you know, we were seeing this, but we got more firm data behind it. Um, we were seeing a large portion, though, unfortunately, these express policy holders were inactive. They, and by inactive, we looked at as 12 months or more of no reported activity. So either we had policies that were taken out and never used, or we had policies taken out, they used it for one year, and then never used it, used it again. Um, and so we were seeing a lot of underutilized transactions. So we were underwriting buyer credit limits that were never utilized or were, were greatly underutilized. And that obviously takes a lot of resources. I mean, as you're all aware, a lot of the scrutiny around the bank, you know, the past several years, you know, we have to underwrite to our published credit standards as well as our internal guidelines because um, we have auditors looking at us and also for proper due diligence. So we have to underwrite a credit you know, going in, thinking it's going to be used, whether it's used or not eventually. And so that takes a lot of time uh, to properly underwrite something. And when we're seeing a large percentage is going underutilized, now I'm talking about the Express product here, um, you know, that, that's taking a lot of resources that could be better spent elsewhere. And we were also seeing um, some, I would say, severe adverse selection by some experienced exporters. I mean, Express, yes, we did set it up to allow selectivity, but it was never intended to be used by very sophisticated exporters to select against us, um, as opposed to if you want to select against us, we have our short-term single buyer product. So, for instance, we saw some exporters who had been extending credit for decades. I'm talking some that said they've been extending credit since the 1970s, and while maybe they were under the threshold as far as that buyer threshold, which was initially 10 that went up to 20, they they only gave us one buyer. And they gave us one buyer for a million dollars on 360-day terms that they were looking for coverage for. And, and that was never the intent of the Express product. So we, we did this analysis, and we're making some modifications. We're looking to make some modifications, and we're hoping these modifications will realign the Express product back to its original purpose. As I've stressed a couple times, the original purpose was to help smaller exporters who were either totally new to extending credit um, or new to markets maybe outside North America who were looking to expand. It wasn't intended for you know, sophisticated exporters to adversely select against us. Um, and I had also talked about how unfortunately we've seen a portion that was going underutilized and that does take up processing time, resources to staff time to underwrite transactions that aren't used and that staff time could be better spent working on transactions for exporters who actually do have um, a viable transaction. So we're hoping with these modifications it will improve the processing time um, as well as obviously improve customer service. And, and lastly, it's going to help us prefer, preserve the uh, portfolio zero reserve status or budget neutrality. Again, I think this has been out there in the marketplace because the past several years with the um, emphasis on Exxon Bank and our operations. Each product at the bank has to operate on basic budget neutrality, budget, you know, subsidy of zero. So even if one program, say, or product of the bank is very successful, those benefits, reserves, uh, what have you, can't be used to offset, say, poor performance in another product. So each product has to stand on its own. And for the multi-buyer product, we've been on zero subsidy, budget neutral since the 90s. Um, and we like to maintain that. I think we all, you know, you, all, most of you can experience, relate to the experience when the short-term single buyer product had to go on that budget neutrality, I believe in spring, summer 2014, and the pricing across the board initially increased. And the nice thing about, in particular, the small business product is we have a nice rate table that's been consistent over the years, so the exporter knows at renewal what their pricing is going to be. And so we like to maintain that. 
but unfortunately we're seeing uh, with a smaller premium base coming in with some of this inactivity or selectivity, we're having a smaller premium base and with that smaller premium base coming in, you know, we have to factor in paying out claims and broker commissions, you know, our cost of doing business and maintaining the portfolio. So the last thing we want is uh, going on budget where potentially every year the pricing could change. So hence, this year for a small business policy, the rate table could be X amount, but next year, depending on the results of the past year, the pricing could change. And that renewal, then these exporters who are used to sort of a predictable set of rights, all of a sudden they increase. So we're trying to reserve, preserve that zero reserve status that we've always enjoyed for decades under the multi-buyer product. So in the summer um, last year, Tom and I reached out to many of you uh, most, some of the most active brokers as far as volume by policies that you brokered under the Express product. And also, also um, Walter Koskiel, who I think many of you know, he reached out to about 80 to 90 individual companies who were Express policyholders to obtain feedback. Um, and as I know, feedback was largely positive. As far as the companies we talked to, that Walter talked to, um, one surprising fact is that a lot of them actually were manufacturers. So they weren't wholesalers, they were manufacturers who were established. And the bottom line is for some of them, they just weren't ready for prime time. They weren't ready to get into the export credit market. Either be, in a large portion was because they needed working capital and if they were able to always get cash, which was great for them, they weren't extending credit. And a lot of them said they just took out the policy because there was a low barrier to entry and they might need it in a year or two. Um, so they applied because there was no barrier to entry, but then they didn't end up using it. And like I said, some of it was a function of they needed uh, pre-export working capital. In some cases, we tried to facilitate them getting in touch with the lender. So specifically, what are these modifications that we're going to be looking at? And the first one is we're going to go back and reestablish the criteria for eligibility. So in addition, like I said, to the regular small, you know, the regular multi-buyer new applicant eligibility of three years in business. You know, we like to see the tangible net worth. Um, we're reinstating, we're going to go back down to 10 foreign buyers or fewer that they've been extending credit terms to. And we're adding a second criteria, which is bullet point number two. They have to have been extending credit five years or less. So for instance, if you have an exporter who today has been extending credit for six years, to Canada and Mexico, we would consider them ineligible going forward as of March 1st for the Express product because we consider them more sophisticated. And again, I go back to our original the emphasis, the intent of the Express product was to help those less sophisticated small business exporters. So there's two new criteria. One is just realigning the buyer limit back to 10 from 20 and then adding this eligibility threshold on the number of years of export credit experience. We're also adding back in, in April 2011, we did away with the minimum $500 refundable advance deposit for all multi-buyer products as long as the applicant was an SBA defined small business. We're now adding that back in for all multi-buyer products, um, whether it's the express product, whether it's the small business policy, whether it's the deductible policy, we're adding that $500 uh, advance deposit back in. And please keep in mind it's refundable. So if they cancel the policy after say three years, that $500 is refunded to them. But we're putting that back on. I think many of you are familiar with that. Where at time of quote, in order to get the quote documents locked in and issued, they have to provide that $500 advance deposit. And lastly, we're establishing uh, a more firm or formal express graduation policy, which I'll talk about in a slide in a moment. As far as some of the modifications that we're hoping to do for the processing, uh, one is we're going to be extending the published turnaround times for these SBCLs, the buyer credit limits under the express from five to 10 days. And per our conversations that Tom and I had, I think basically all of you said you never sold express on the fact that we promised five day turnaround time. So, um, this shouldn't be a takeaway, um, but the reality is with some of these small exporters, when they do submit these buyers, the buyers tend to be small, and we go to reach out to the credit reporting agencies to get a credit report, and they don't know them, so they have to do an investigation. 
and that sometimes takes up to over a month. So the bottom line is we're we're extending sort of our to make it more clear and to realign to what we've been seeing, we're changing that five day turnaround to ten. And the next we are designing uh, in online, and this probably won't be in, implemented totally for six months or so. An incomplete status, and this is going to be for any application that comes in line, so not just a multi-buyer express, but any multi-buyer, including the single buyer, where we're going to have the ability to put that transaction on an incomplete status, send you and the applicant um, an email via the system that says, in order to complete this review, we need, for instance, maybe the buyer's updated financial statements. An email would go out from the system, you be able to track on your landing page, which of the pending applications are incomplete, and then once that information is obtained, you'll be able to update, upload that data into online, similar to how the claims process is set up right now. For those of you who have submitted claims, there's an ability to upload any additional required data that they might require via the, the um, online tied to that claim. So we're going to set up this the same way, where you be able to submit the financials, or credit report or whatever financial or credit information we need via online and then it would restart the clock on our end. It would go back into the loan officer's inbox as it's now been submitted as complete. So we hope to have that. Like I said, that's going to take several months, but that's our intent. And it, like again, I stress it's not just for the express applications, it's for all applications that we process online. And I apologize if some of you can't see. We on our end, maybe you can't see it, but on our end, we are getting a screen come up. And unfortunately, our RT person just left the room. So if you guys can see it, great. Um, Ed's trying to work his IT magic here really fast. Oh, that's. <laughs> um, okay. Bear with us one second. Okay, there. Hopefully now you can see it clearly. Um, this is the express graduation criteria, which is going to go into effect on June 1. So for those policies that are becoming into us new on, on March 1, and then for those existing policies that are coming up for renewal effective June 1, so those June 1 renewals kick off on April 1, we're creating firm graduation guidelines. Uh, again, to emphasize, express was never intended to be an evergreen product where once someone gets in, they stay forever. Um, and the reality is many people are in who probably no longer meet the criteria, i.e., two years ago they came in, they applied, and they had 18 buyers. So they were two buyers shy of the threshold. And the reality is, in most cases, we haven't been asking at renewal, where do they stand now? So during the course of the past two years, they might have obtained 10 more buyers that they haven't been giving us, and they've been extending credit to. So in theory, they're beyond the 20 foreign buyer credit limit, but yet they still maintain an express policy. So the only ones we've sort of actively graduated uh, were ones that were, they submitted more than 20 foreign buyers for us to review under the SBCL process, and or they breached the threshold of 7.5 million in annual export credit sales, or a few asked because the brokers thought maybe they'd be better off with a deductible policy based on their markets, they got a lower rate, and they were comfortable extending credit terms now. Um, but this is to establish firm guidelines. So at the third renewal, so going into their fourth year as an express policyholder, they need to convert to either whole turnover, so they give us the whole book of business and they want to do the regular small business policy if they qualify, you know, non-deductible. They do the deductible policy if we're now we're getting whole turnover and they're beyond 20 or they're beyond 7.5 million. Um, the reasonable spread of risk. For those of you who aren't as familiar with reasonable spread of risk, it's a multi-buyer type policy where you tell us what you got and our general cutoff is as long as we're getting at least 50% of that eligible book of business, the other 50% you can say, for instance, insure on your own. So either a reasonable spread of risk or lastly, if they only have one or two buyers they want to insure, they can go to the short-term single buyer product and you know work with Amy Shinkman shop. So a quick example, uh, you know, a company in California's express policy holder, they came to us in August 2013. This year, it'll be they're going into their fourth renewal. When their renewal comes up, we would reach out to you and ask them 
you know, how, what do they want to handle, how they want to handle conversion? Are they interested in maintaining the whole turnover policy? Do they want to do a reasonable spread of risk? Or do they only have a couple of buyers, they really decided they want to insure and they're going to do short-term single buyer, and the rest of their portfolio, maybe they now have a private sector policy, um, or they're self-insuring. We, to let you know as far as what the universe here we're talking about, as far as eligible companies, we ran, um, we ran some numbers, and starting June 1 going forward, there's only about, say, 10 to 15 policies, express policies that would come up each month that would be, that meet this criteria where they've now going into their fourth renewal. And just to let you know, with our over 2,000 policies, so annually, um, every month we see about 150 to 200 multi-bar applications kick off for renewal. So say of that 150, only about 10 are now going to fall in this express graduation category. And when they kick off, and as you know, they kick off 60 days prior to expiry, the loan officer that handles that territory will be reaching out to you to say, you know, hey, can you contact your client and how do they want to handle they now need to graduate. So next steps. Um, by March 1, we're going to get all our web uh, marketing material and the website updated to reflect this new criteria. And a reminder again, the new criteria is going back to 10 buyers from 20 and also requiring that they have less than five years or less export credit experience. There's really no updates we need to do to process starting today uh, in online or to the, the export uh, express application form, the hard copy form, or even when you submit it online. The only thing we're going to be tweaking to online, as I mentioned, is allow the status of incomplete, and then the ability to upload data to incomplete applications. So there's nothing we really have to do other than that. And as I just mentioned, uh, the loan officers in our group will be reaching out to your to you on which companies are going to be affected by this, starting with the June 1 renewals as far as the graduation, and discussing with you on how they want to handle it going forward. So we appreciate all the feedback we've gotten from you guys over the past year. And we look forward to, you know, obtaining more feedback on how this goes, gets implemented going forward. Um, and so I had a few questions already that some brokers had asked. And so I want to go through these, and then I'll take, if there's any online, we have some. One uh, question is, will EOL function to upload missing credit data be available to both the broker and the applicant? Um, yes, that's our intent. I think one thing right now we were working on trying to get, I know someone had asked Lauren, I think many of you know Lauren, um, who works with us on our EO, um, on online, trying to get right now, once an application is submitted, you can't see the attachments, and trying to get that um, accessible to see. The only potential issue with that is some companies don't want their financials uh, release to the broker and so depending on how those financials come in that's like the one hurdle that is our problem quite frankly is if that's still the case how are we going to manage that because if they if an applicant doesn't want you to see the financial statement and that's a requirement then an answer to that question it would have to be no because they you know we want them to update it online but they don't want it to show it to you so that's something that's quite frankly, it's still an outstanding, uh, an outstanding issue of how to work that. And maybe at the end of the day, some of those, they would just have to email it to us. And we obviously then store it internally here. Um, but that's something we're looking at. But that is the one issue with that um, ability to upload additional credit information, the sensitivity of some buyers also don't want the exporter to see their financials. So um, that is an issue. Uh, someone just said, can't they email? Yes, they can, but obviously that sometimes poses a administrative issue of if they email to the wrong person and getting it to the right person. But yes, they, they can email. Um, some of the questions that we got ahead of time I just wanted to address now. One of one was, was all, would all current, so they're currently uh, an express multi-buyer policyholder, as of June 1, would they be grandfathered in and be able to keep their 20. So yes, if you're currently in, on March 1, we're not going to kick you out if you have 15 buyers. However, that those current express policyholders are subject to this graduation. So when they come up uh, on their fourth year renewal, 
they'll be asked to graduate. Or if during the course between now and then, if they breach that 20 buyer limit and they submit 20 or more buyers, um, and or they, they graduate because they're over the annual threshold of 7.5 million, then they would have to graduate under those circumstances. But anyone that's currently in house, we're not going to all of a sudden ask them, you know, to graduate if if they're, you know, under between 10 and 20 right now. But there are those other criteria. Um, another question came up as far as the eligibility and as far as the threshold of that five years of export credit experience. And yes, if someone's been extending credit for six years just to Canada, that counts, even though Canada, Canadian sales are technically a standard exclusion under a multi-buyer policy. Again, it, the whole point was going towards whether they're sophisticated or not. So it doesn't matter whether they were exporting on credit terms to Canada, Mexico, UK, Brazil, they were still extending credit. They were still making foreign buyer credit decisions. Canada's a foreign market. So um, even though Canadian sales are a standard exclusion, yes, that their experience, if it was just all Canada, would count towards that five years experience. Um, also, with the $500 refundable deposit going back on, someone asked, well, how does that affect current policyholders that were quoted after 2011 and there was no $500? They're not going to be charged $500 at renewal. So they're just, they never had it as long as they remain a policyholder. We're not going to add it on. It's just when they cancel their policy, there's nothing to refund because they never paid anything in. But at renewal, we're not going to ask them to pay $500. So once you're in, without the $500, you're in. But for quotes we issue after March 1, we're going to be putting that $500 refundable deposit back on. Um, those were some of the ones we got ahead of time. Let me see if there's any other ones online. I think that was the right now that's the bulk of the questions I got the ones I answered ahead of time and I don't know if there's any other ones uh, someone wrote effective on quotes after March 1 so I, I guess that was a question in response to my discussion right now about the $500 so yes quotes issued after March 1 will have the $500 refundable deposit issued on them if that was the question Any more questions online? Oops. Okay. How will the premium rates be affected? Well, actually, that's, I'm glad someone asked that question. For the premium rates for those who are converting, many of these small businesses who are finding these express policy holders, they already are giving us whole turnover. So if they want to stay and give us whole turnover and they're eligible for the small business policy, in fact, the rates are going to go down. For example, one to 60 day rate under the express policy, 65 cents. Under the small business policy, whole turnover at 55 cents. So for some of them, the rates could go down. Or depending on their book of business and they want to do a whole turnover, if they have, say, mostly Western Europe and Canada, their rates could be in the low 30s if they want to take a small deductible. So that's what at time of these that were being asked to convert, um, you know, the, uh, the loan officer is going to work with the broker on figuring out what does the customer want and give them, you know, the, the best option. In some cases, the rate's going to go down for some of these exporters. I mean, yes, going forward, when they have to add new buyers, they're going to have to obtain a car report themselves or the trade reference. But on some of these, some of them might actually appreciate the lower rate. So hopefully I answered that question. Sorry, some of these are sort of long, so if you can give me a moment. Anita and I are reading these. Hold on one second, sorry. Um, a broker asked, they said the adverse or the ability to select is an attractive option. And they said, have we thought, talked about looking at a select market policy where policyholders can choose the markets they wish to insure? Well, I mean, we can talk further offline, but the bottom line is we, we do have our reasonable spread of risk policy that does allow them to tell us which buyers they want to include and which buyers they want to exclude. I know some brokers have asked us about basically sort of an open policy where they just decide what they want to include. Well, we, we can't really do that because how can we price our risk going forward? We can't walk into 
something where we don't know what, what our portfolio is going to be for the year. So we need to know up front, what are you going to insure and what do you want to exclude so we can pro, you know, appropriately reprice it. So we can talk further offline on that, but you know, for a lot of these, we do have that reasonable spread of risk policy, which should, for the most part, provide coverage for those exporters that want to, in theory, quote unquote, adversely select against us. And if it's a severe adverse selection, that's what we have the short-term single buyer product for. As I had mentioned, the reasonable spread of risk, we generally want to be getting at least 50% of your eligible book of business. Um, recently, we've had a few requests that was really pushing that boundary where they're only giving us, say, like 10%. And, and we're just not, that's just something we're not comfortable with right now, um, particularly depending on who the markets and the industry is. So on those, I mean, that's why we have the short-term single buyer product that can fill the gaps in where the private sector is unable or unwilling to, you know, look at a risk. The next question is, all these modifications effective March 1? March 1 is the effective date for the new eligibility criteria, but we're not going to implement the graduation for existing express policyholders till June 1. So hopefully that, that answers one. So effective March 1, if you're a March 1 renewal that's up for express right now, we're not, and you're, eligible, and you're at that fourth year renewal, we're not going to be reaching out and saying these need to convert. We're giving, that's why we're doing this discussion now to provide some time to the marketplace. It's going to be June 1 for existing express policyholders. Sorry, we're, we're looking at these questions. Some of them get along. If you can get us a minute to read them. One of the questions was insured as 10 buyers. This was always, uh, regardless of what the threshold was, it was buyers on credit terms, to whom they're extending credit terms. So if they have 10 buyers and half of them they're getting cash in advance, they have 10 foreign buyers, they're not extending credit to them. So they'd be under, this was buyers to whom they're extending credit terms, unsecured credit terms, which does include BAD, does include unconfirmed letters of credit. So for us, what we mean by secured credit terms is they're getting cash in advance so they have confirmed letters of credit. Uh, the question was, will the 60-day express premium rate still be $0.65? Cents? Yeah, I mean, we're not talking about changing any of the pricing here on the product. What I had mentioned was when someone's up for renewal and they're, if, if they meet that threat, their new graduation threshold and if they want to do whole turnover, their rates might actually go down. I mean, the current endorsed rate for the $0.65 cents for the regular whole turnover is $0.55. Cents. For the express, it's $0.65. Cents. We're not, right now, there's no contemplation, there's been no discussion or contemplation about changing any of the uh, set rate tables or our pricing for any of the product. It was just the eligibility criteria. Uh, one question is, if an applicant wishes to convert from an express policy prior to their, I, I assuming prior to their renewal date, um, bottom line, and this is true for, of anything, regardless of whether you have an a EMB policy, an ESC policy, during the course of the year, we can't change a policy type mid-year. We can make modifications to the current policy parameters, but we can't change from, say, a whole turnover EMB policy to a reasonable spread of risk policy, which is a deductible policy. We can only change policy types at renewal. We're happy to do something mid-year, but basically what that would involve is we would need a new application. We'd have to cancel the current policy. So you'd have a new, like I said, a new application request would have to come in and there'd be a new policy number. So we, we can't change policy types. The only thing we can change mid-year is if you have currently an express policy and you want to do a whole turnover small business policy. So you're going from the EXP to the EMB. That's the only quote-unquote policy type we can change. Um, but we can't go from EMB to an ESC. We can't go from an ESC to an EMB. So we could go from an express to an EMB mid-year if they're giving us whole turnover. But if they want to do select risk, we can't do that mid-year. So hopefully that answered that question. Um, 
I think I got the bulk of the questions there. Um, someone had asked some follow-up questions on the SBCL attachments. The intent is, yes, it would, the same situation with this incomplete is allowing the ability to attach credit information, like I said, to all transactions, as well as, like I said, there's that issue of whether the what attachments a broker can see. Um, I mean, often, at least with the SBCL, the foreign buyers will just email those directly to the loan officer. Um, it's just sometimes with the exporters, they'll take over finishing submission of like say a new multi-buyer or ESS application and at that time when they submit it they'll update their financials and like I said that goes to the issue of what we make available um, to the brokers in terms of attachments to the application and maybe there's some way that attachment if it's clearly marked as financial statements can be grayed out somehow so that's something we're working on with our IT folks. So if there's no other questions, um, you know how I think everyone knows how my contact information is on there. For those of you who uh, aren't as familiar with myself or Anita, please reach out to us, phone or email. We'd love to get your input. If you have any other further suggestions or how to make this process, especially in terms of the graduation process, smoother on any of your clients, any suggestions, we'd be happy to, to hear that. And um, we look forward to working with you in the coming year. So thank you, Jean, very much for your explanation. And hopefully that was helpful to everybody. As I said in the beginning of the call, um, this information will be made available as a follow-up, um, uh, hopefully on the website, both the webcast and the content, um, and we'll try and do that as soon as we can. Um, a couple questions did come in that were not directly related to the express changes, so um, uh, for those of you who sent those in, we'll get back to you offline, um, and, uh, and if we don't, please follow up with me, uh, if you will. Um, so with that, um, again, I'd like to thank you for calling in. Um, wish you all a very successful and happy 2017, and we'll be talking to you soon. Bye-bye.